Long time ago in Slovakia, there was a belief that a wild bison named Bison Poland lived in a dark forest. It would take disobedient children away during the night and hide them in a dark tree hollow. It would then tell them about Slovakia's oldest faith. Children who were devout in their faith would merge with Bison Poland in the darkness and attain eternal life. However, those children who consistently disrespected and scorned the faith would lose their sight and hearing. They would tragically die as they fumbled their way out of the woods. This urban legend seems to have been created to frighten children into being obedient. It's unclear if the person who came up with this story ever received a visit from the local child protection department. Nevertheless, this story includes two rather peculiar elements. First, the place where children learn about the faith is a pitch black tree hollow, and second, disobedient children have their senses deprived, essentially sensory deprivation. In our daily lives, we often hear about how blind people have better hearing and smell. The saying, when one door closes, another opens, is not baseless. When a person loses their vision, there is a relative reduction in input to the brain's cortex, leading to a redistribution of cortical functions, making other senses more acute. However, if all our senses are deprived, what changes will occur in the body? Today, we will discuss sensory deprivation experiments and explore the deepest fears within the human psyche. If this is your first time tuning into our channel, the primary focus here is to provide critical perspectives on historical or societal controversial events, offering insightful descriptions and commentary. If you're interested, please consider subscribing to our channel and turning on the notification bell. Let's get started. In the 1950s, Professor Donald Hebb of McGill University in Canada originally designed sensory deprivation experiments. The experiment's process was quite simple. He had 14 college student volunteers lie in isolation chambers for two to three days. The participants wore semi-transparent blindfolds, had their ears plugged, and used gloves and wristbands to isolate their sense of touch. The purpose was to limit their sensory experiences as much as possible. Except for eating and using the restroom, they couldn't leave the isolation chamber's bed. Volunteers in the experiment were compensated with $20 per day, which, when adjusted for today's prices, is nearly $100. At the outset, volunteers thought lying in bed was an easy way to make money, but the experience of being confined to a small, pitch-black room was much more challenging than they had imagined. The isolation chamber was extremely cramped, only accommodating a bed, and one side had an observation window. At first everything seemed normal on the first day, and many participants took the opportunity to catch up on their sleep. However, oversleeping would eventually lead to waking up. With the brain deprived of sensory input, participants had to rely on their imagination to pass the time. In less than three days, many participants began to experience hallucinations. These hallucinations started as simple geometric shapes, progressing to three-dimensional figures and even whole scenes. These hallucinations wouldn't disappear, even when researchers attempted to converse with the participants. Some participants couldn't endure the experiment and gave up early. Many experienced symptoms like anxiety, restlessness, altered perception of time, and an inability to think as they had before. This unique discovery made sensory deprivation experiments a hot topic in research in the 1950s and 1960s. In the early 1960s, scientists found that when isolated individuals imagined familiar scenes or people, the images that appeared in front of their eyes were even more vivid and persistent than in real life. This phenomenon became more pronounced with increasing time spent in isolation. In 2008, a British science history documentary series called Horizon aired an episode titled Total Isolation, which faithfully recreated a controversial sensory deprivation experiment. The experiment was led by Professor E. N. Robbins at the Department of Psychological Trauma at St. George's Hospital in London. Robbins divided six volunteer participants into two groups. One group experienced complete sensory deprivation, wearing eye masks that allowed only minimal light perception, sensory blocking mitts, and noise-cancelling headphones. The other group experienced partial isolation, being placed in a pitch-black room where they couldn't see anything. The room was extremely cramped, with only a table and a bed, the six volunteer participants had diverse personalities and professions, including long-distance runners, meditation enthusiasts, photographers, and even a psychologist. Before the experiment began, Professor Robbins conducted a series of tests to assess the participants' overall cognitive abilities, including visual memory tests. Participants were asked to view a picture and then, 30 minutes later, reproduce it from memory. Before the experiment, most participants could reasonably reproduce what they had seen in the picture. The second part is an information processing test. Professor Robbins would give the participants a sheet of paper with many words that denote colors, but the words' meanings would be different from the ink color they were printed in. 
For example, the word black might be written in green ink, green in red ink, and red in black ink. The participants were required to state the color of the ink the words were written in, rather than reading the words. Before the experiment, most participants could easily pass this test. The third part is a language fluency test. Participants were asked to list as many words as possible that start with a specific letter within a very short time, like listing as many words starting with A as they could. The fourth part is a categorization ability test. In this test, participants were asked to list the names of various animals within one minute. The fifth part, and the most crucial one, is the language suggestion test. Professor Robbins would narrate a story and, 30 minutes later, ask the participants related questions. During the questioning, Robbins would intentionally mislead the participants, for instance, asking them if the answer was A or B, even though neither A nor B had been mentioned in the story. Before the experiment, most participants could accurately identify these full species of information. Next, they endured a grueling 48 hours in the small dark room. After being isolated for just over 10 hours, participants started to lose track of time due to the lack of light. The participants subjected to complete isolation were allowed to remove their sensory blocking mitts because they found them uncomfortable. Some participants began to exhibit bizarre behaviors, like incessant head shaking or rearranging objects in the room. When the 48-hour period was over, all the participants felt a sense of relief and renewal. Following the isolation, Professor Robbins re-administered the initial five tests to compare changes in their central executive system capabilities. Without exception, all participants experienced memory decline, delayed reaction times, and an inability to think as they had before. In the visual memory test, the words that the participants reproduced were much simpler than the original drawings they were shown. In the information processing test, the participants could identify ink colors at a significantly slower pace after 48 hours, with the slowest participant taking 69% longer than before, and they had a high error rate. In the most crucial language suggestion comparison test, Professor Robbins told the participants another story. 30 minutes later, he asked them if the story's little boy was scared by a vehicle driving down the hill. Only one female participant correctly answered that there was no mention of a vehicle driving down the hill in the story. Robbins then asked whether John in the story grabbed the little boy's arm or shoulder. Again, only the female participant correctly stated that John grabbed the bicycle. Some scholars believe that after isolation or confinement, men are more susceptible to suggestions and more prone to distorting their own memories and accepting externally imposed information. However, many scholars argue that the sample size in this experiment, which only included two females, was too small to draw conclusive results. Because the fully isolated group had their sensory blocking mitts removed midway through the experiment, this experiment doesn't strictly qualify as a complete sensory deprivation experiment. The differences in the results between the two groups were not significant. Nevertheless, even in this modified experiment, it was evident that the 48 hours in the small dark room had adverse effects on all participants. Professor Robbins also mentioned that during the Korean War, many American soldiers who were captured and later returned to the United States exhibited stronger versions to their own country. Some of them even believed that the actions of the US military were inhumane. Professor Robbins speculated whether this could be related to the fact that these American soldiers were isolated for extended periods during captivity and subsequently subjected to brainwashing. The results of such experiments make us wonder if those who are held in prolonged solitary confinement as suspected criminals might be very susceptible to manipulation during interrogations, leading them to provide unreliable statements. In this BBC documentary, several long-term detainees were interviewed, one of whom was Brian Keenan, a university lecturer. Brian had been held as a hostage in a windowless, lightless underground cell for a harrowing eight months. During that time, his mental state was pushed to the brink and he had to rely on his imagination to fill the void. He even had moments where he questioned whether he was still alive. He would occasionally pinch his own jaw or face to prove to himself that he had sensation. Once, Brian experienced a vivid hallucination of being alone in a desert, going through extreme heat and then piercing cold, watching the wind blow the flesh of his body until only a skeleton remained. Brian also had auditory hallucinations of symphonic music. At first, he found it quite amusing, but the music grew louder and faster, driving him to continuously bang his head against the wall to escape the sounds. Even after being rescued, it took Brian a long time to reintegrate into normal life. The normal functioning of the human brain relies on moderate stimulation. Even people who stay at home can maintain the health of their cerebral cortex through stimuli like the internet, television, sunlight, music, and more. Newborns start receiving sensory stimulation from the moment they are born, and this type of stimulation helps the brain establish intricate neural connections. 
In contrast, sensory deprivation can weaken or sever existing neural connections. When the brain is deprived of sensory stimulation for extended periods, it begins to generate its own hallucinations. However, sensory deprivation is not without any positive aspects. Research has shown that short-term sensory restriction can actually lead to better relaxation for the entire body. A well-known application of this concept is the sensory deprivation tank therapy, which many people become obsessed with. If you have a friend who goes for a sensory deprivation tank therapy session and comes back talking about topics like the edge of the universe or the meaning of life, and they haven't taken any drugs or adopted unusual beliefs, then it's highly likely they visited a sensory deprivation tank. Sensory deprivation tanks use highly concentrated Epsom salt solution to simulate the sensation of floating in a zero-gravity environment, much like the experience of floating in the Dead Sea. The water temperature inside the tank is the same as the human body's temperature, ensuring that you neither feel hot nor cold. Some people describe it as being in a warm, dark womb, enveloped in warm, buoyant water, while others liken it to exploring the deepest reaches of the cosmos. Currently, most sensory deprivation tank sessions do not exceed a few hours to avoid the negative effects of prolonged sensory deprivation. In fact, hundreds of years ago, our ancestors recognized the importance of sensory stimulation for humans and even used it as a form of punishment for serious criminals. In the 1730s in Rome, Italy, a cruel device known as the hunger mask was introduced. This mask left only a small gap near the mouth, allowing the prisoner to eat, but they could never feel full, experiencing constant hunger. Simultaneously, the prisoners would feel fear due to the sensory deprivation. In the early 20th century, there were also archaic sensory deprivation devices used on mental patients and unruly criminals. Patients or inmates would be forcibly strapped into a specially designed chair that deprived them of their sense of hearing and sight. According to records, patients treated in this manner invariably developed more severe mental illnesses after being released from the chair. Even the earliest diving suits inadvertently made this mistake. To withstand the immense water pressure in deep-sea environments, the entire body was enclosed in a heavy, iron suit, creating a sensation of confinement, much like being trapped in a small room. Furthermore, the limited light available in deep-sea conditions easily induced extreme anxiety in divers. This is one of the reasons why, with advancements in deep-sea diving technology, there has been an increasing demand for high-quality underwater lights. All these experiments and harrowing cases tell us one thing. Extreme loneliness is one of the greatest enemies of humanity. Not to mention the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, which brought about psychological issues for many people during the isolation period, including anxiety, depression, and even a surge in divorce rates. However, regardless of the circumstances, quarantine during the pandemic was a necessity. There's another form of isolation, though, filled with various sorrows and helplessness. I remember in 2018, I came across two news stories related to death. One was about an elderly Canadian couple in their 90s, George and Shirley, who, after 73 years of marriage, decided to choose assisted suicide. The other news story was about Daiki Kita, the second son of the Japanese superstar Saburo Kitajima, who was found dead at home at the age of 51, having passed away over a week earlier. One was a heartwarming fairy tale like story where life and death were as one, while the other was a lonely and tragic death discovered long after the fact. According to a 2015 statistic, among the 1.5 million people who passed away in Japan that year, 30,000 of them were individuals who lived alone and died quietly due to illness or other reasons, unnoticed by anyone. This phenomenon is known as lonely death. Among them, there are public figures like Daiki Kita, but more are ordinary people. We know that Japan has entered a highly aging society. As of 2019, the population of Japanese people aged 65 and over accounted for 28.4% of the total population. In recent years, the increasing number of lonely deaths has given rise to a new industry, estate cleanup companies. These companies specialize in posthumous cleanup for the desolate individuals who died alone. When they arrive at the homes of deceased elderly individuals who lived alone, they often find piles of newspapers, empty instant noodle bowls and utensils, and empty beer bottles. The rooms emit a strong odor. You don't need to imagine too hard to guess how heart-wrenching their final days must have been. In December 2017, in a residential area in Nanjing, China, an 81-year-old lady was discovered deceased more than two months after her passing. In her room, there was a letter left by the elderly lady on the mid-autumn festival, October 4th, saying, I left last night. I left with a peaceful heart. The neighbors mentioned that the elderly lady had previously lived in the urban area, had children, but she had moved to this place over seven years ago. Even on festive occasions, her children didn't come to visit her.
Before her passing, the elderly lady had not been seen outside for over three months. The neighbors initially thought she had gone to visit relatives. In her final moments, the elderly lady was still concerned about not causing trouble for her children and reminded them not to sweep the room but to mop the floor to prevent leaving any bacteria. Cremation was kept simple. Parents being far away from their children has become a common occurrence in today's society. Life is a series of farewells, but being alone in an empty room, facing death alone, is another matter. Even the most accepting individuals may have some good intentions when confronted with such circumstances. These elderly individuals living alone, in the final stages of their lives, may have been immobile or attempted to signal the outside world, but were never noticed. This, in a way, can be seen as a form of sensory deprivation. Humans are social animals, and we spend our entire lives trying to avoid loneliness. The connections between people draw us into the world, as it is in the presence of others that we truly experience life. That's all for today. If you want to continue supporting this channel, remember to like, comment, subscribe, and click the notification bell to ensure you don't miss any episodes. Lastly, if being radical is the new norm and objectivity is considered heretical, perhaps we should be radically objective. Until next time, stay curious and stay unconventional.